This Home Alone star has just pleaded guilty to domestic violence charges over two years after assaulting his then girlfriend. Devin Rattray rose to fame when he played Buzz in Home Alone 1 and 2. But in 2021, 30 years after he played Buzz, he was arrested on domestic violence charges. Out with his girlfriend at a bar in Oklahoma and he'd become angry after she didn't charge two women for his order. When they got back to their hotel room, he attacked her. He pushed her onto the bed, held one hand round her throat and the other hand over her mouth and said, this is how you die. He then took his hand off her throat and started punching her repeatedly in the face. She managed to break free and run from the room for help. She was left with a cut lip and bruises on her face and chest. He was arrested at the time, but he was later released after posting a $25,000 bond and he denied the allegations. But just this month, he has actually pleaded guilty. He has, however, avoided jail time and he's been sentenced to three years probation. This Home Alone actor has pleaded guilty to a horrific crime. Devin Rattray became famous in the early 1990s as Buzz McAllister on the Home Alone films. He played Kevin's volatile and aggressive older brother on Home Alone 1 and Home Alone 2. He has now pleaded guilty on two counts of DV to avoid prison time. The now 47-year-old actor was accused of violence against a woman in December 2021. His girlfriend at the time reported him to police after he punched her in the face, covered her mouth with his hand and also attempted to strangle her. She told police officers that the pair had gotten into an argument at a bar. She left to go back to their hotel room and that is where the assault occurred. The police report says that he allegedly threatened the woman, saying, this is how you die. He pleaded guilty to one count of domestic assault and battery by strangulation and another count of domestic assault and battery. He has been ordered to do behaviour intervention plan classes and have a substance assessment. It goes without saying that he has also been banned from contacting the victim in this case. This volunteer at a church tried to sell a teenager on the dark web. This is Kelly Garrett Ivy from Central Georgia. And last June is when these crimes occurred. So Kelly was a part of a dark web website called Slave Bay. The website on the dark web sold slaves themselves or people that had been abducted into slavery and the website also sold personal information of people. Basically, if people had information about where a vulnerable young man or woman lived, yes, even children were up for grabs, they would attempt to sell the information about places they frequented, what times they were usually alone, and obviously stuff like their phone number and home address. Well, at some point, Kelly, while attending the church that he volunteered at, came across a 16-year-old girl that he befriended. Just to talk about this website one more time, this is just one of the more disturbing corners of the dark web. The dark web is a place where anything can be purchased, CP, CSAM, different things like narcotics and apparently even slaves and humans. So I don't know exactly how investigators track Kelly down or discovered that he was the one that was trying to sell a 16 year old girl on the internet, but they eventually did. They got their arrest warrant, they took him in and he's been in prison since. That's because, thankfully, they denied his bond, so he's had to sit in prison until his hearing. And based on the charges that this guy has stacked against him, hopefully he'll be in there for a very, very long time. This woman vanished under mysterious circumstances and her family are now desperate for answers. This case was actually a request from a victim's family member, so please be kind in the comments. It was 1993 in Anchorage, Alaska. Sandra Bennett was 41 years old and was born in California. She moved to Anchorage years prior to her vanishing. She worked as a waitress in a local cafe and was a mum to three. She was reportedly dating a man involved in substance dealing from New York. It was around 7 p.m. on November the 4th. She left the Carousel Lounge bar with a large sum of money. She reportedly had between $13,000 and $17,000 with her and was due to meet two men. It was believed that this was part of some sort of substance deal. She drove to meet them in her blue pickup truck and seemingly then vanished into thin air. Her car was then discovered the day after abandoned with the door ajar. It was in a car park for a 7-Eleven convenience store on the corner of Arctic Boulevard and International Airport Road. Her glasses were inside the car. Her case went cold and she was declared legally dead in 1995. 
Her death was classed as a homicide, although her body has never been found and no one has ever been arrested in this case. The theory is that she may have been robbed and killed during the purchase of substances. Tragically, her case remains unsolved and her family are wondering if now is the time that anyone feels comfortable to reveal any information. The backstory behind this photo is absolutely heartbreaking. At first glance, this photo looks like a kid just having fun playing in some type of sand. But this photo was actually taken moments before a tragic situation. On August 3rd, 2023 in Brazil, seven-year-old right here named Arthur Bittencourt was walking along the side of the road with his parents until they stumbled upon a random excavation site. At the site, Arthur noticed a pile of white sand that was dumped near the scene. So he then went over to the pile of white sand and jumped in it to have some fun. And his parents then snapped this photo of him with his thumbs up. But moments after this photo was taken, Arthur started to experience weird side effects from inhaling the white sand. And his family then immediately rushed him to the nearest hospital. Doctors tried a lot of things to help him, but he was dead on arrival. His family was completely devastated, but it turns out the white sand that Arthur was playing in was actually limestone dust and when inhaled, it can cause serious health issues that include permanent damage to the lungs or even death. And this was the last photo Arthur's family took of him before his unfortunate death. Many people have questions about this case, like why was there just a big pile of lime dust laying somewhere? And why did his parents just let him jump into an unidentified pile of sand? Many people believe that the company that dumped the limestone dust should be sued or charged with this death. But the main thing is, why would his parents just let him play in this unidentified pile of sand? I feel like this tragic incident could have been avoided so easily. Rest in peace to Arthur, this is just completely unfortunate. This sick pedophile's actions were recorded and put on TikTok. So this is 61-year-old Peter Jeffrey Williamson. People that knew Peter said he was a very normal, very kind, very happy guy before all of this went down. But sadly, in the year 2019, Peter's son was gunned down in Spain in a brutal crime that was unsolved for a while. And according to the victim, that's when Peter began to abuse them. You see, in the past, Peter had actually been convicted of child-related crimes. This included full physical assault of a 13-year-old and the indecent assault of girls aged 10 and 15. So it's shocking that Peter was given access to another child, but the child's mother had no idea of this past. So Peter would come to see the girl's mom, and then behind the mom's back, he would abuse her daughter. And he even told the young girl that he had killed before, and he would have no problem killing again. Eventually, though, the victim recorded one of the assaults and sent the video footage of this assault to friends and relatives in an attempt to expose Peter. Now, the relatives and people who spoke to the media after this said that it was the most shocking, disturbing, disgusting thing they had ever seen right when they opened TikTok to view that sort of graphic footage. But once again, this always happens in England. This guy only got 10 years in prison for this series of assaults, 22 assaults, actually. Keep in mind, he'd also been convicted in the past of abusing three separate children. I don't know why the hell this guy is going to get out of prison again, but this should be one of those situations where you... Uh, lock them up and throw away the key. Do not watch this video if you are easily disturbed. This is this sickening, very recent case of Lily Peters. On the 24th of April, 2022, 10-year-old Lily Peters was making her way home from her auntie's house in Wisconsin. She was biking and she was familiar with this route because she'd done it many times before. When she didn't return home that night, her dad reported her missing to police. What transpired was her parents' worst nightmare. Her body was discovered the following day at around 9 a.m. Officers located a bike that ended up being Lily's in the woods near a walking trail at the end of her aunt's street, and her body was discovered shortly after. Disturbing details emerged about Lily's death. She'd suffered blunt force trauma and had been strangled. Her body had then been SA'd. But who on earth would do such a thing to such an innocent little girl? Two days after she disappeared, police charged Lily's 14-year-old cousin, Carson Peters. He'd allegedly been riding home with Lily when the horrific incident occurred. It's alleged that he punched her in the stomach and attacked her. Now, the case is still ongoing, but he has admitted to the attack. Interestingly, his father is Adam Berger, who is pictured here. He spent three years in prison for being a convicted P-file. Now, Carson's bail is set to $1 million, and if convicted, he could spend life in prison. 
This woman literally lost her life over a bag of frozen chips. She was murdered by her childhood sweetheart, who she'd been married to for 24 years. Yvonne and Thomas McCann had a rocky relationship and they'd often argue. Their son even told his dad that it was about time he let her go so she could be happy. But Thomas didn't want anyone else to have her. On May 23rd, 2020, they'd been enjoying a family barbecue, but the couple had been arguing after a bag of chips was left out of the freezer. They weren't actually together by this point and Yvonne had actually started seeing someone else. It was on this day that Yvonne went missing. Thomas said that they'd argued and he'd ended up dropping her off near the home of her new partner. But he needed to back up this story, so he'd used Yvonne's phone to reply to messages from their children. What Thomas had actually done was strangle Yvonne to death in the bathroom. He then dismembered her body in the bath and dumped her body parts in rubbish bags near a recycling centre. He'd then passed out on the sofa and when his children got home, they checked his pockets and found Yvonne's phone and her jewellery. And it was at this point that they realised it had been Thomas messaging them, not Yvonne. Thomas was arrested and he told police that he had killed Yvonne and he said that he'd disposed of her like trash. He also referred to himself as Hannibal Lecter. Yvonne's body was found two days later by dog walkers and Thomas was charged with her murder and sentenced to life with a minimum of just 13 years. This teenager laughed as he talked about how he killed his mum. In a notebook, he'd written, you can't spell slaughter without laughter. It was 2012 and Melanie Davis was a 45-year-old mother living in Tennessee. Now, Melanie was raising her two sons on her own after her husband had tragically passed away six years earlier. Her youngest son, Zach, had been really struggling since his dad's death. He'd been hearing voices and he'd become really withdrawn. He'd been diagnosed with schizophrenia, but he wasn't actually receiving any active treatment for this. The oldest son was called Josh. On the 10th of August, the family had been out that night to the cinema. They returned home and both Melanie and Josh separately went to their beds and slept. Zachary, though, had a different idea. He got a sledgehammer from the garage and took it to his mum's bedroom. He then launched a vicious attack, hitting her over the head multiple times. He ensured that his mum was dead before trying to set fire to the house with his brother Josh still inside. He used whiskey and petrol to start the blaze, but luckily Josh escaped. He smelt the smoke and fled the property. Neighbours rang authorities and police rushed to the scene. Melanie was found deceased and Zach was tracked down. Chillingly, when he was questioned about the attack, Zachary actually said that he regretted not going and killing his brother with the sledgehammer too. When recalling how he killed his mum, he actually started laughing. Two months prior to him going on trial, he was interviewed by Dr. Phil. In the haunting interview, he chuckles about his mum's murder. He told Dr. Phil that he'd killed his mum because, quote, she wasn't taking care of my family. He then admitted to laughing while he killed his mum. He was eventually given a life sentence plus 20 years for attempted first degree murder and arson. Family captured a ghost on a roller coaster. It was mainly focused on this kid. From what I saw, they said that he had a fear of roller coasters, so he doesn't feel lonely or scared. His family members also go on the roller coaster as well. It's a total of eight family members. As they're going, you see something in the back. No People say that it could be somebody that died in that theme park, but like. Oh, you People were saying how so there's a part where the roller coaster slows down a bit, or maybe somebody hopped on really quick and then hopped off whenever it slowed down again. Nah, mm, I don't think so. Nah. Bro. First of all, it was going pretty fast, and it was slowed down or whatever, bro. But like, I feel like it would be tough. It's to do too dangerous. Like yeah, yeah, I feel like it would be crazy. And the way he was sitting too, it looked like he would have his seatbelt on. It. He couldn't be ducking either because his oh, yeah. family member, right? Yeah. It looks yeah. like they're tight. That guy, when you saw him, he was straight up like this, bro. Yeah. If you would have dug, bro, like, nah. This man from Crawley was murdered due to a jealous love rival. 
Harrison Tompkins was 25 years old and a lifeguard from Crawley. It was the 13th of August 2023 and Harrison was at a flat in Arthur Road. He was in bed with Alicia Parrin, aged 20, in the early hours of the morning. Alicia had recently split with her ex Caden prior due to him being jealous and controlling. Caden had once told her that he would kill her if she was ever with anyone else. When they split, Alicia decided to get her own flat as a step towards becoming more independent. She was clearly moving on and had started to see Harrison. Alicia and Harrison had started to get to know each other after working in the same leisure centre. They'd been spotted out together by a mutual friend and the friend informed Caden's friend, Jason Curtis. Little did anyone know that Harrison's love rival Caden had been on a birthday night out in Chelsea in London that night. After hearing the news that Harrison was with Alicia, he decided to cut the night short and leave with Jason. The pair travelled to Alicia's flat with a brutal plan. Caden and his friends stormed into Alicia's flat and repeatedly stabbed Harrison with a hunting knife. Harrison was stabbed in the legs, chest and back. Alicia screamed for help and was punched in the face by Caden. The pair fled the scene around 5.30 a.m. Caden left the murder weapon there and told his friend Jason to burn his clothes. Jason was found by police hiding in a bush and Caden was arrested in his flat. He had with him a bag of clothes covered in Harrison's blood. Caden and Jason are both charged with murder and their trial is currently underway. Harrison's family have set up a fundraising page for him and I've linked it in my bio. This man is pure evil, and this case makes me realize that not everyone deserves to have kids. Sterling Cummings spent 45 days in jail 10 years ago for shaking his first baby. He's now been charged with murdering his second son. In August of 2012, Sterling was arrested for shaking his three-week-old son named Andy so badly that he went fully blind and now has cerebral palsy. Sterling and the baby's mom, Brianne, were charged with child abuse, but from what I can find, Brianne left the state and was never prosecuted. As for Sterling, he was sentenced to 45 days in jail. That's it, 45 days in jail for permanently injuring his three-week-old baby. His children were then placed into foster care, but Sterling would go on to get arrested again in 2015 in an unrelated incident for beating and strangling a woman. Fast forward to May of 2021. Paramedics were called to Sterling's home in Greensboro, North Carolina, and found his three-month-old son, Waylon, unresponsive. According to Waylon's mom, she left the house to go and grab some food, and at that time, Waylon was perfectly healthy. When she returned home, she noticed that the bottle of milk that she made Waylon was untouched, and when she asked Sterling about this, he said that he didn't hear Waylon, so he didn't bother to feed him. And when she checked on her son, he wasn't breathing. Waylon later died at the hospital, where he was found to have retinal hemorrhaging and an abnormal MRI. During the investigation, Sterling's story changed many times, and the scene was described by police as suspicious. But it would take two years, and also being charged with two separate counts of assault on a woman, for Sterling to be arrested for murdering his son. On May 22, 2023, Sterling was officially arrested and charged with first-degree murder and felony child abuse. During his first court hearing, he showed absolutely no emotion. People who know Sterling described him as manipulative and a sociopath, and would likely do it again if given the chance, so hopefully he gets life in prison. This is the Madden 19 tournament shooting, and whatever you do, don't look up the crime scene photos. This is a picture of two contestants competing in the 2018 Madden 19 tournament. But this photo was actually taken seconds before a tragic disaster. On August 26, 2018, the Go Look Have Fun Game Bar in Jacksonville, Florida, was hosting a Madden 19 video game tournament, which had roughly 130 to 150 participants and onlookers. One of the gaming participants named David Katz, who you see right here, and when he lost his Madden game, he immediately became furious and walked out of the building, not even shaking the winner's hand. And around 1.30 p.m., another contestant named Elijah Clayton was playing a match with another opponent when he was suddenly shot in the chest, which sadly ended up taking his life. It turns out that David Katz returned to the tournament event with one of his handguns, and fired 12 shots, ultimately killing two gamers and injuring 11 others. The police tried to stop David Katz, but it was too late because he took his own life. And the crazy thing is, when the police were looking back over the footage, they saw a laser pointing directly at Elijah's chest. So what you are seeing right here is the last ever image of Elijah before he was fatally shot. Now the crime scene photos of this entire ordeal are just really disturbing. They might be the clearest crime scene photos you will ever see. I'm surprised how easy they were to find and they didn't even bother covering up the faces. But as always, I don't recommend looking them up because they are pretty disturbing. But nonetheless, this case is extremely crazy and this happened all over a simple Madden game. 
This guy was definitely going through some issues that he just brought to the Madden game that day. Rest in peace to Elijah, and I can't believe this happened. I wonder for you guys, what's called The Girl in the Basement. I've never seen this. It's about a girl named Elizabeth Fritzel, and for 24 years, she was locked up in a basement, tortured by her father, Joseph Fritzel. In 1956, he ended up meeting a woman who ends up being his wife. Her name was Rosemary. He ended up giving Rosemary seven kids, and he specifically grew obsessed with Elizabeth. Wherever he would go, Elizabeth had to be by his side. At age 11 is when it all started. he started sneaking into her room and... As she got older, when she hit like 17, 18, Joseph started realizing that she's going to become an adult and I'm eventually going to lose control over her. So he lured Elizabeth down to the basement, put chloroform on a rag, put it on her face until she knocked out. Ended up handcuffing her and put her all the way in the back of this prison, the cellar he was building this whole time specifically for her. For the next four to five years, Joseph would come down there, give her basic necessities for her to survive. Also, constantly. After, in 1988, Elizabeth would get pregnant with Joseph's kid or whatever. She was telling Joseph to bring her to a hospital so she could at least give birth at the hospital. Joseph was not letting that happen. He was like, nah, fuck that shit. If I do, he's going to get caught. So what he did was he just threw a book about pregnancy, told her to read it, gave her a scissor to cut the umbilical cord. She did end up giving birth to the child for the next several years. He ended up impregnating her with six more kids. How come none of her siblings or anybody, like, how did they not realize this shit was going on? It's because he was... All right, anybody in Houston, please help me out here. So, my car is out of gas right now. I'm on the highway. I want to fill you in real quick. Recently, my wife and I purchased a haunted object at an antique shop here in Houston. And this thing has put our life through a living hell. Uh, two days after we bought the object, we crashed our brand new vehicle that we had just purchased. The day after that, I spilled liquids all over my laptop. And instead of being recoverable, the laptop turned on by itself while I was trying to dry it out. And I completely lost all my data, everything that I stored on there for the last three years that hadn't been backed up. That's all gone. My wife just got into another car incident. We had a really strange, angry interaction with a local man on our vacation. We had some other content creators reach out with some really rude messaging um, in the past week. Just a lot of really negative, intensely negative energy. And to cap all of this off, I just picked my car up from the collision center where it has been for a week and a half and I ran out of gas on the highway while I'm going to pick up my laptop which also was destroyed. So if you know anybody who does energy healing or energy work in the Houston area, we need a cleansing. My wife and I really need a hardcore energy cleansing. This is this is really bad. I've never seen something quite like this and I've been ghost hunting for for years, for almost 10 years now on, on YouTube. So if you have any recommendations, please let me know in the comments, send me a message. We are very freaked out right now, and I'm sitting in the middle of traffic, sweating my ass off because, yeah. And I, at first I was like, there's no way it's this doll. Now I'm starting to think it's this doll, because it's really, it's been a lot. But, uh, yeah, please just let me know. This will put you off ever going to a bar again. Savannah Spurlock was on her first night out since giving birth to twins. She was 22 years old and she was now a mother of four. She needed some time to just let her hair down and relax. However, she was captured on CCTV cameras leaving a bar in Lexington and this was the last time she was ever seen alive. In the footage, she's actually seen walking with three men. Two of the men are unidentified, but one of the men is David Sparks. She actually got into the car with the three men and while she was in the car, she FaceTimed her mum. She tells her not to worry and says that she will be back in the morning. Worryingly, she wasn't back the next day. No one had heard from her since that FaceTime in the car. David Sparks claimed that she had stayed with him the night, but then left in the morning. When police asked David about Savannah's whereabouts, he said that he did not know where she was, but probably working on baby number five. Seems like a very callous and uncaring quote from somebody who you've just spent the night with. Months went by with absolutely no sign of Savannah. Then one day a call came into the police. A man called to report a foul smell coming from an area at his farm. It turned out that this man was the father of David Sparks. Horrifyingly, Savannah had been bound with tape and wrapped in a carpet. She was then buried in a shallow grave on the farm. Police arrested David and they did also discover that he had blood spatter in his wardrobe. 
They also found a disturbing note written by David claiming that he was a psychopath monster. His neighbours also reported to police that David had a short temper and would be enraged if you told him no. David was sentenced to 50 years in prison and Savannah's four children will now have to live the rest of their lives without a mother. This is the worst botched execution of all time and you won't believe how disturbing it actually is. This electric chair execution that I'm about to explain went disturbingly wrong in so many ways. And to make it worse, the prisoner was only 14 years old. In 1944, George Stinney was thrown on trial for the murder of two girls in South Carolina. The only circumstantial evidence was that he was the last one seen with the girls alive. They had reportedly asked him where they could find passion flowers. There is no denying that the color of his skin played a huge factor and it took an all-white jury less than 10 minutes to find him guilty. On June 16, 1944, George was ushered into his death chamber. The young boy only weighed 95 pounds, which was apparent by how baggy his stripped jumpsuit was. His legs were too thin for the electrodes to fit, and the electric chair looked giant in comparison and his feet didn't even touch the ground. Finally, the adult-sized mask was placed over his petite face, was clearly not going to stay put. And when asked if he had any last words, his voice quivered and cracked, and all he said was no sir. When the switch was flipped to begin the execution, his small body shook violently. This dislodged the mask, revealing his tear-drenched, pain-riddled face and wide blood-red eyes. He smoked and burned and writhed, filling the chamber with a pungent stench of cooking flesh. After the first round, George still wasn't dead. Another round was administered, causing his face to contort further. His eyes bulged and it almost looked as if he was sizzling. But he was still breathing. Finally, after the third round, George was pronounced dead. But the largest mishap of all wasn't revealed until decades later, when his guilty verdict was overturned. This is just insane to wrap your head around, and this literally happened less than 100 years ago. Do you notice anything worrying about this image? This harrowing image played a huge part in solving a murder. Eddie Forrester was a 55-year-old man from Blackpool. He was described as a quiet and harmless individual who wouldn't hurt a soul. He was last seen in Seafield Road at half past one in the afternoon on the 1st of September. The next day, when he failed to meet a friend for dinner, he was reported missing. Officers were dispatched to Eddie's flat where they made a worrying discovery. There was blood on the door downstairs and the forensic team sent the blood off to be tested. They then searched the flat of his neighbour, William Wilkinson, age 65. When they entered the flat, they noticed that William wasn't there, but it was apparent that his flat had been cleaned up in some sort of way. The forensic team also found blood in William's flat, including on the carpet, on the stairs and in the communal hallway. Concerningly, the blood came back as a positive match for Eddie. Concerningly, the blood came back as a positive match for Eddie. Investigators also found a broken wooden stick with a heavy metal bung at one end in a bin liner. They realised that if Eddie was dead, this may be the murder weapon. William was tracked down and arrested in Windermere a couple of days later. When interrogated, he denied any knowledge of Eddie's whereabouts. Officers then started looking at CCTV around the area at the time of Eddie's disappearance. William was captured walking around Blackpool with carrier bags and disposing of them. It's believed that in these images, inside of those bags, were Eddie's remains. When disposing of the bags, he stopped off at places such as a car boot sale and even to the barbers to change up his look. He was charged with murder and police set about trying to find Eddie's remains. A breakthrough occurred on the 13th of September when they discovered partial human remains in a suitcase near Ashes Lane in Staverley. Investigators stated it was likely that Eddie had been attacked shortly after returning home that Friday afternoon. They said the reason for the attack remains a mystery, but he was struck in the head with the wooden stick multiple times. William then dismembered him and systematically disposed of his remains. He was sentenced to life in prison. After this girl was interviewed about her missing friend, she also went missing. 12-year-old Ashley Pond and 13-year-old Miranda Gaddis were school friends from Oregon. It was 8am on the 9th of January 2002 and Ashley was actually running late for school that day. The bus stop was 10 minutes from her home but tragically that day she never made it to school. Her mum would raise the alarm when she got home and realised Ashley wasn't there. She called the school to be told that Ashley had never turned up that day at all. Now, Ashley was a well-liked girl who was involved in the school swim and dance teams. Everyone figured she had no real reason to run away of her own accord. 
search and rescue teams were deployed in the local area. News crews were around obviously interviewing locals about the missing girl. Ashley's friend Miranda was interviewed on the news about the disappearance of her friend. Months passed by with no news until the 8th of March when chillingly Miranda would vanish too. Again, this was at around 8 a.m. on her way to the bus stop. In a remarkably similar turn of events, Miranda's mum came home, discovered that she wasn't there, rang the school to be again told that she hadn't turned up. The local community was horrified that these girls, both similar in age and appearance, had vanished from the same place at a similar time of day within just months of each other. Clearly this was no coincidence. The trail went frustratingly cold until a breakthrough. On August the 13th, Ward Weaver's son rang police. He stated that his dad had tried to R his 19-year-old girlfriend. He stated his dad had also confessed to murdering the two schoolgirls. Now, Ward apparently knew the girls because they were friends with his 12-year-old daughter. Investigators searched his home and found the remains of the girls on his property. Ashley was buried under a slab of concrete. Ward had a history of violence against women and shockingly, Ashley had even reported him for trying to R her. Infuriatingly, police had never investigated this. Ward would plead guilty to the murders and got two life sentences without parole. Interestingly, his stepson was convicted of murder in 2014 for killing a substance dealer. Ward's dad was also placed on death row for murdering two people. This is the prison beheadings, one of the worst prison videos ever explained. The extremely disturbing video that I'm about to explain is 1 minute and 32 seconds long and it was shot during the middle of the day in the prison courtyard. As soon as you play the video, you are met with complete carnage, blood, and chaos. People can be heard shouting in the background and the cameraman paces around. As he walks around, you see several dead bodies lying in pools of blood. You also see a prisoner in the background beheading an inmate as you hear him scream for his life. The cameraman continues to walk around and as he does this, you see more bodies. However, he spots a man who is still alive. He is lying on his back next to a deceased corpse. The victim has already suffered severe injuries. His head looks swollen and more than likely sustained a brutal beating. He may have also been stabbed as he is laying in a pool of blood, though the blood could be from the corpse next to him. The cameraman then appears to hand a knife to an inmate who has entered the shot. The inmate with the knife bends down and covers his hand over the victim's mouth and then proceeds to slice open the victim's throat. The blade is razor sharp and due to the close up shot, you see the flesh separating as the blade cuts through his throat. Blood pours and you see the victim's severed windpipe move back and forth as the victim tries to breathe in air. Blood bubbles then form as he attempts to get oxygen and this creates a disturbing wheezing sound. The killer then tries to cut through the victim's spine by trying to chop through it with the blade. Every time he strikes the spinal cord, it causes the victim to raise his arms, more than likely due to the nerves. It's extremely, extremely upsetting and disturbing. He cuts through the spinal cord quickly and then slices through the remaining flesh finally decapitating the poor victim. The head is then thrown on the ground and the knife is given back to the cameraman. The cameraman then bends down next to the other corpse which the man who was decapitated was lying next to, and he stabs the head in the eye in a playful manner before getting up and wandering around. He then spots another dead body that is lying on the ground with its arms and legs stretched out in the starfish position. He bends down next to the corpse and you see that the eyes have been gouged out. The cameraman then jams the knife into the eye socket and shakes the blade around as he laughs like a maniac. The cameraman then leaves the scene and approaches a group of inmates before the video finally concludes. In the video, there was at least 7 to 8 dead bodies in the facility, all of which suffered a brutal death as shown in the video. It's an extremely disturbing video and watch, and as always, I don't recommend searching for it. However, according to the phrase, you can't make this stuff up. We have known the story of real life boogie man, Albert Fish. A slight elderly man with gray hair, no one suspected the kindly single father of being sadistic child, murderer, and cannibal. This murder seriously sounds like it's something straight out of a horror movie. 21-year-old Laura Davis was chased out of her home through a pasture and to a place called the Wishing Well, where she lost her life in a brutal attack by someone that she'd just broken up with. Laura had met Jordan Taylor while she was living in Derby, where he was in a band, and their relationship moved quite quickly with Jordan moving in with Laura. But Jordan quickly became very controlling. 
He would tell Laura who she could and couldn't see and he would tell her what she could and couldn't wear. The couple lived in staff accommodation at the Essex Horse and Pony Protection Society, where Laura was an apprentice. She'd told other staff members that she couldn't just kick Jordan out and make him homeless, but that she was planning on ending the relationship. On July 3rd, 2015, Laura and Jordan sat down in their kitchen to eat a meal, and Laura told Jordan that it wasn't working out anymore. Jordan absolutely lost it, and he launched a frenzied attack on Laura. Jordan first stabbed Laura in the kitchen, but she managed to run outside. He then followed her and chased her through the pasture and to a place called the Wishing Well, where he carried on the attack. He inflicted over 80 stab wounds on Laura, including 18 in her face, 24 on her arms, 15 times on her torso, 14 times on her legs, eight times in her back and three times in the back of her head. A passerby actually heard screaming and they looked over to see Laura on the ground and Jordan crouching over her, stabbing over and over. This passerby did run off but they called 999 and the police arrived within 15 minutes. They found Jordan absolutely covered in blood. They found the knife and they then found Laura under some bushes. She was still alive and she managed to whisper help before she was rushed to hospital where she lost her life. Jordan Taylor pleaded guilty but said that he did kill Laura. The jury at his trial was shown CCTV of the attack as well as being shown the knife which Jordan used that had been bent to a 45 degree angle due to the ferocity of the attack. Jordan was sentenced in January 2016 and he received life with a minimum of 23 years. This girl killed her mother in a very brutal way and whatever you do, don't look up the picture. This horrific incident happened at a family's home in Istanbul, Turkey on May 24th, 2021. 35 year old Tuxi Sayan, who was on the left, murdered her 67 year old mother named Selvia Polabiak, who was on the right. Tuxi Sayan was said to have flown into a rage after her mother refused to sign the apartment over to her. The pair had reportedly been arguing for some time about gaining ownership of the mother's home, and eventually the argument heated up and turned into something truly disturbing. It is said at this moment, Tugsy had enough and allegedly murdered her mother before dragging her lifeless body into the bathroom and cutting off her head. Tugsy, who is a qualified emergency medical technician, is believed to have used her intimate knowledge of the human body to secretly dispose of her mother's body. She reportedly planned to chop up the rest of the body, including stripping all of the meat off the bone of her left leg before she was caught. Worried neighbors raised the alarm about the house of horrors after they were unable to contact the mother. They immediately called the police who rushed to the address. Once at the home, officers found themselves face to face with the daughter. However, Tuxi refused to allow the cops to enter her flat. They persisted until she gave in when one of the cops questioned Tuxi about her mother saying that her mother was not home and that she went out early. She also added, she still hasn't come home, I don't know where she is. While she did not allow the police to enter the flat at first, she reportedly admitted that she had killed her mother after a short time saying, I killed my mother, she is in the bathroom. Officers were left stunned to find the butchered body with the meat completely removed from the woman's left leg, and her head was in a pot in the kitchen filled with water. Whatever you do, do not look up these crime scene photos, they are truly horrific. According to the police, the human meat that was removed from the leg was put in a bucket. Local media reported that the young woman wanted her mother to register the flat in her name and was murdered because she refused to do so. It is now revealed that Tugsy's mother, the victim, had filed a complaint against her daughter previously. She reportedly said, my daughter is going to kill me. First she took my bracelets, then she asked for my house. She threatened me with a knife. Tugsy reportedly said in her statement to the police, I am schizophrenic, my mother attacked me and cast a spell. Tugsy has been admitted to a mental facility after she was determined mentally ill. This case is truly disturbing and how could anybody do this horrific act to their own mother? Jeffrey Epstein's private plane, the Lolita Express, that was used throughout all of his sex trafficking operations is about to be torn to pieces. This is breaking news that was just announced a day or two ago, so let's talk about it. So if you don't know what the Lolita Express is, it was Jeffrey Epstein's private plane that he used to fly all of his victims around the country, around the globe. 
And it was the flight logs on this plane that have become one of the major points of contention in the entire Jeffrey Epstein case. Because you see, there were tons of celebrities and politicians that flew on the Lolita Express, including Bill Clinton, who's pictured right here with Ghislaine Maxwell. And there's just something about this picture that rubs me the wrong way. I mean, this is a former US president standing on a private plane of a sex trafficker holding another sex trafficker who's convicted and now in prison for a photo. And he is claiming he had no idea what was going on. But yeah, according to this news article, a man bought this airplane at an auction just thinking it was another airplane. He had no idea of the previous history. He was hoping he could kind of refurbish it, fix it up, resell it. But when he learned that the plane he purchased was the Lolita Express, one of the most infamous planes ever built, he decided he would just scrap it and sell all the parts. And it's totally understandable because of the wicked, dark, cruel, twisted history of this plane. There are some pictures of the interior of the plane though that are interesting that were posted with this article. I mean, look at this couch. There was a bed in the plane with a ton of different sets of linens for easy use and changing. Eerie, just like looking in the bathrooms and the cabinets. There were tables, different chairs to sit in. And these pictures just ooze eeriness. I mean, who knows what kind of evil twisted shit was going on in these chairs and in these spaces especially in the bed right here, the chairs. I mean, this plane just looks dark and just evil. And it's hard to imagine all of the young girls who were looking in these mirrors, staring at themselves, being forced to do the unthinkable. I mean, it was a really nice plane, but I really, really wonder what they're gonna find when they tear this thing apart. I mean, I don't think that Epstein or any of his associates would be stupid enough to leave something like recording devices or audio recordings, video recordings somewhere on the plane. But if Jeffrey Epstein did have those secret cameras and audio recorders hidden all over the plane like people claimed he did, who knows what they're gonna find. And once again, I just wanna add how strange it is that there are so many celebrities and politicians that flew on this plane that are logged in the flight logs and they claim to be completely just in the dark about this entire operation. And I find that just so, so incredibly hard to believe. This is going to be the most disturbing cartel video I ever explained, so this is a massive, massive trigger warning. This is really one of the worst things I'm ever going to explain on this channel, so whatever you do, never look it up or search for it. I honestly couldn't even watch it. The video that I'm about to explain was released in the summer of 2021, and the motive behind what happens in the video is unknown, but it is thought to be a rival cartel-related killing. The video is 4 minutes long, and it's filmed in the middle of the day in a jungle location. Many refer to this video as the Venezuelan Butcher Shop. As you play the video, you see a man who looks to be in his 30s squatting on the ground with multiple men talking in the background. A man then points a pistol at the victim's head and pulls the trigger. The victim is still moving, however, and he is then shot multiple more times, and at this point, the victim is dead. A cartel member with a machete then enters the shot and begins to hack away at the victim's neck to decapitate him. And after a couple strikes, the head is cut clean off. The cartel members then move on to dismembering the victim's arms. One member holds the arm as another cuts it off. Once again, after a couple strikes with the machete, both arms have been cut off. At this point, the cartel members then move on to the victim's legs. And just like the arms, one member holds the legs up as the other hacks away at them. Other cartel members can be heard chanting and talking in the background. One of the cartel members then takes one of the severed legs and begins beating the victim's corpse with it. The victim's body parts are then thrown in what appears to be a well. The cartel member with the machete then takes the machete and cuts vertically down the victim's torso, from the top of his chest to the abdomen area. And this is where the video gets absolutely disturbing. After a cavity has been made, multiple men in a very, very disturbing scene begin to grab handfuls of the victim's guts and organs and proceed to throw them in the well. They then cut what is left of the victim's body in half and cut above the hips. And in a matter of seconds, they cut the victim's body in half. The rest of the hips and legs are then thrown into the well. The cartel members then butterfly what is left of the torso. They slice it down the middle and pull the ribs apart, as well as removing the heart. One of the cartel members then holds the heart up to the camera, which is still beating. All of the cartel members then take turns holding the heart. Two of the men then play tug of war with the heart. Then what is left of the torso is then thrown into the well and the video finally concludes. 
In a matter of a couple minutes, this man's body was viciously dismembered, gutted, and completely destroyed. This is honestly one of the most disturbing videos on the internet and you should never want to see it and you should never look for it. I honestly didn't even watch it fully, I just read descriptions of the video because it's that brutal. I will never understand the ruthlessness in this world and this video just goes to show how disturbing our world actually is. Sometimes true for strange and fiction. The case of Richard Trenton Chase is a story which even the most depraved horror writer would struggle to create. Over the course of four weeks spanning across 1977 and 1978, Richard Chase took the lives of six innocent victims in Sacramento, California. His murders gradually progressed in violence, beginning with drive-by shootings and culminated in acts of cannibalism, necrophilia and extreme mutilation. This is one of the most horrific cases I've heard recently, so please be warned before watching. 29-year-old Taylor Parker has just been sentenced to death for a crime so horrendous that I can't believe a human is capable of this. Regan Simmons Hancock and Taylor had met online. Their online friendship soon blossomed into a real-life connection. It was 2022 and Regan was married with a young daughter. She was also eight months pregnant at this time. Taylor was also pregnant, or so it would seem to the outside world. She was posting pregnancy pictures on social media and even hosted a gender reveal party. Little did her loved ones know that she was actually staging the entire thing. Regan and Taylor were really good friends around this time and they were bonding over their pregnancies. Regan even shared a Facebook status thanking Taylor for bringing her around a gift and Starbucks. This was the day before she would be murdered by Taylor. On Taylor's supposed due date, she made her way round to Regan's house in Texas. Shortly after, Regan's mum made a horrifying discovery. Her daughter was face down on the floor, deceased with blood everywhere. Her mum rang the emergency services and they raced to the scene. It became apparent that her baby had been, and again, a massive, massive trigger warning here, ripped out of her stomach and Regan had been stabbed over a hundred times. Meanwhile, Taylor was pulled over for speeding and driving erratically. She'd actually put the baby in her lap with the umbilical cord coming out of her trousers to make it seem like she'd just given birth. When the pair were taken to hospital, the horrors of what actually happened became apparent. The newborn baby tragically passed away and Taylor was arrested. She was sentenced to death, but her defense lawyer said that her loved ones should have done more to protect her earlier on when she was pretending to be pregnant. This is Jared Fogle, one of the worst pedophiles in American history. So if you don't know who Jared Fogle was, he was the spokesperson for Subway for a number of years. Jared initially became famous and then eventually became the spokesman of Subway because he dropped so much weight while eating a Subway diet. According to Jared, he lost almost 245 pounds while eating almost exclusively from Subway. Obviously, this was a huge story and when Subway heard about this, they contacted Jared and eventually made him the spokesman for their entire company. I swear to God I remember this. For years you couldn't turn on the TV without seeing this guy's face. So in 2004, when Jared was at the height of his popularity, he launched the Jared Foundation, a foundation determined to fight childhood obesity. This foundation saw Jared touring schools across the nation, talking to kids about losing weight, and yeah, just being heavily involved with children, which people at the time thought was a great thing. But it was when he was away from the cameras, behind the scenes, when Jared was engaging in some of the most deplorable behavior I've ever read about. So in 2007, a radio host and journalist from Florida came forward to the FBI and reported that Jared was saying and doing some concerning things. Apparently, while at a middle school event, Jared had been talking to her about performing lewd acts on a minor. He had texted her about all of these things, and she even recorded him saying all this stuff. At one point, apparently, Jared even asked this journalist if she could install webcams in her children's bedroom so he could watch them. Obviously, this was concerning. This journalist recorded all of this, turned it into the FBI, but they told her that they couldn't do anything because they didn't have enough evidence. And now we got to talk about Russell Taylor, a guy who was heavily involved in Jared's foundation. So when he wasn't working on the Children's Foundation, this guy, Russell Taylor, was producing CP in his home. Apparently, between the years 2011 and 2015, Russell Taylor had videotaped minors in his own home and traded photographs of them with none other than, you guessed it, Jared Vogel, King of the Footlong. According to court documents, Jared actually asked Russell if he could move some of the nanny cams in his home so he could watch children in varying states of undress or while they were naked taking a bath. Russell also claimed that Jared made him set up accounts on porn sites in his name and he wanted to basically run his whole CP operation for him. Well, shortly after Russell Taylor was arrested, Jared Fogel's home was raided and guess what they found? A ton of CP. On the same day that his home was raided, Subway severed all ties with Jared and some new disturbing facts came to light during the trial. Apparently years prior, Jared had been texting a Subway franchisee named Cindy. 
And over these texts, he talked about wanting to abuse kids aged 9 to 16. He told Cindy she should sell herself for sex on Craigslist, and even asked her to arrange a sexual meetup between him and her 16-year-old cousin. Eventually, Jared pled guilty to possession of CP and traveling to conduct an illicit sexual behavior with a minor. Apparently, while in New York City, he paid to have sex with a 17-year-old girl. But this story isn't over yet. I'm going to post part two, and it definitely gets more interesting from here on out. Not watch this video unless you have a very strong stomach. This case is truly sickening. On August the 31st, 2019, Margaret Sumney was unreachable. Her family knew something was wrong. They tried and failed to get hold of her for two days before notifying police to ask them to do a welfare check. When police went to her house in Pennsylvania, what they discovered was horrifying. They found shattered glass all over the floor and blood smeared on the walls. They found the 67 year old's body in the bath. She'd been beaten to death. The autopsy revealed that she died from blunt force trauma to the head. Police interviewed her son, David, who initially denied having anything to do with her death. However, police searched his phone and found absolutely disgusting images. They uncovered 277 sickening pictures, including selfies of David with her body, his face smeared in her blood and doing a thumbs up pose. Police also discovered that David was in possession of his mum's jewellery and several blank checks. He also had a record of previously assaulting his mother twice and attacking his now deceased father once. The same year as his mum's murder, he allegedly waterboarded and strangled his ex-girlfriend in an Atlantic City hotel. It's reported though that he just slipped through the cracks in the police databases, allowing him to go on to offend again. He was soon arrested and it was found that when he'd committed the murder of his mother, he'd taken a large amount of Adderall. His defence argued that he had diminished responsibility due to his substance and alcohol use. Originally, he was facing charges of first-degree murder and abuse of a corpse. However, due to a legal loophole, he entered a guilty plea, so he would only be charged with third-degree murder. He was sentenced to 20 to 40 years in prison. Terrifyingly, as he's now been in prison since 2019, and due to his good behaviour behind bars, he could be released in just 17 years. John Wayne Gacy, the killer clown, did not act alone. This TikTok series is about to blow your mind, but there's a lot of information here, so proceed with caution. The case of John Wayne Gacy, the serial killer clown, is one of the most infamous true crime stories in American history. A brief overview of the case, in the 1970s, John Wayne Gacy murdered 33 young men. He buried them in the crawl space beneath his home and his yard, and he was connected to a number of different crimes. Gacy himself gained infamy because he dressed up as Pogo the Clown on the weekends and volunteered at hospitals and children's birthday parties. Now, the official story says that John Wayne Gacy acted completely alone. He had no help in carrying out any of these murders, but I really don't believe that that's the case. Through all of our research that we did for our podcast, we've determined that Gacy was connected to a number of other killers, pedophiles across America. And he even may have been connected to one of America's other most infamous serial killers, the Candyman out of Houston, Texas. So before we get into this, I want to state that I do believe that Gacy did murder some people, and I think he was very complicit in all of this, obviously, but I don't think that he acted alone. But why do I think that? So to start off, we need to talk about Jeffrey Rignall, this guy who was actually a survivor of John Wayne Gacy. After a night of abuse and essay at the hands of John Wayne Gacy, Jeffrey Rignall was allowed to go free. But what Jeffrey would go on to tell authorities and the media about what happened that night at Gacy's home is a major thing in this whole conspiracy. Now, Jeffrey would tell the police that while Gacy was essaying him, there was another man in the room. Now, whether or not this other man participated in the essaying or they were there to watch, it doesn't matter. Someone was watching this criminal act occur. He knew he could give a description of the guy, and he knew that someone else was there watching this happen. Then we get to Robert Bob Gilroy, who was a victim of John Wayne Gacy. So Robert Gilroy was abducted on September 15th, 1977. That's the official date that he went missing. He was supposed to show up for an event after that day, but he never showed. But John Wayne Gacy's plane tickets and records placed him as being out of the state at the time. His plane tickets from the time show that Gacy left Illinois on September 12th, and he didn't return until September 16th, the day after Robert Gilroy went missing. Already, these two facts point to a larger conspiracy at hand. There may have been people helping procure victims for Gacy, and he may have been even paying for these victims. And that's when we get to Philip Paskey and John David Norman, two of the most horrific people I've ever read about. And this is where the connections with the case start to get really shocking. And we've talked about John David Norman here on my TikTok before. This guy was connected with the higher ups in the government. This guy had lots of political power, and he was a known pedophile. 
Remember, in earlier TikToks, I even told you about how John David Norman was arrested multiple times. He had Rolodexes full of index cards of the people who he was supplying these young men to. And both times, the police departments lost the Rolodexes and lost all the names of the abusers. But how did they connect to Gacy? Well, in part two, we're going to talk about it. This little girl got revenge on her killer from beyond the grave. On the 25th of January 2005, Katie Coleman finished school and went back to her home in Indiana, United States. Katie was 10 years old and lived with her mum and dad and sister. At 3pm that day, her mum asked her to go to the dollar store to get toilet roll. Now Katie knew the area well and it wasn't really far to go. After getting the toilet roll from the shop, Katie stopped at the bank to get a lollipop for her way home. However, when Katie's dad returned home, the little girl still wasn't back. Her parents called police and a few days later an Amber Alert was issued. A witness came forward to say that they'd seen a girl who looked like Katie in a truck. The driver was described as a skinny white man about six feet tall with short dark hair and fair complexion. Tragically, five days after going missing, Katie's body was found. It was in a creek just a few miles from her home. Disturbingly, her hands and feet were tied and she had been essayed. It was determined that her cause of death had been drowning. 20-year-old Charles Hickman rang the police to confess. He said he and another man had abducted Katie after she'd witnessed a substance deal. He said they tried to scare her into not saying anything and they tied her up, but she ended up falling in and drowning. Disgustingly, this turned out to be a false confession. This obviously wasted police time and caused massive amounts of distress to Katie's family. Police continued to look for evidence and they did find a cigarette butt near to Katie's body. They tested it for DNA and it matched a man called Anthony Stockelman. Police compared the DNA on the cigarette butt to the DNA on Katie's body and it was a match. Anthony, a father of two young boys, was in the area that day visiting his mother. He entered a guilty plea and was given life in prison without parole. But this is not the only punishment that Anthony would receive. Now, Anthony claims that he was under the influence of extreme mental or emotional disturbance during the crime. He said this is because his father had died six months prior. Regardless, Anthony was imprisoned. Unlucky for Anthony, he was actually housed in a prison with Katie's cousin. Jared Harris was serving a sentence for burglary and was in the same wing as Anthony. Jared forcibly tattooed the words Katie's revenge across Anthony's forehead. He wanted to brand Anthony for life for killing his young cousin. This pedophile was so terrible that when he was released from prison, they actually put out a public safety warning, warning people to stay away from this guy. This is James Alfred Cooper, who Canadian officials nicknamed the worst pedophile in Canadian history. So back in 1903, James was convicted of the brutal essays and torture of six children in Canada. And apparently he had used a number of torture devices to keep these kids from talking. He had used a cat o' nine tails, a cow whip, a cattle prod, belts and sticks. I mean, six victims, they all went through so much and this guy was responsible for all of it. James's background is shrouded in mystery. Nobody knows too much about what he went through as a kid, but he was convicted of assault when he was 22 years old back in 1958. And years later, his criminal career started out with burglary. So at first, when he would break into houses, he would just steal things for the thrill of it. He would take family photos. He would take fridge magnets, items from the kitchen. But that evolved into him wanting to wake up the people that he was robbing. He would stand over these people's beds, wake them up violently in the middle of the night, and then escape out of a window or through the door that he broke in through. But that involved into a desire to S.A. people inside of their own homes. At one point, he essayed a minor in their own home at knife point after waking them up in the middle of the night. He also did the same thing to a single mother while holding her at knife point. I mean, this guy was terrible and it would only get worse. At one point, though, he married a woman named Patricia, who already had three kids. He would eventually have another child with her. And this is when the abuse of children began. And this is when the abuse really started. He would use these horrific tools to actually torture and abuse the children that were living under his own roof. And he did these mind games with the kids. He even made them eat things like their own excrement out of their pants while everybody in the house watched. I mean, this guy was sick and twisted. I mean, there's so much to the story that is so graphic and disturbing that I cannot talk about it here on TikTok. If you want to look it up, there's a great article online that explains this whole case and it's it's just really hard to get through. But he would even do things like buy tubs of ice cream, rub it on his body and make his children lick it off of him. He even at one point invited a neighborhood girl over with one of his own children and he essayed both of them. 
Keep in mind this whole time he was also physically abusing the children, beating them. He was verbally abusing them. He was just the worst person. I can't even get that across how bad of a guy this dude was. Eventually, though, in 1987, he finally was arrested and charged with doing all of these horrible things. Eventually, DNA would link him to some of the break-ins that he had committed as well and the assaults that he had committed during those break-ins. And at the time, he was given a 30-year sentence. Now, that doesn't sound like very much, but in Canada, that was the longest sentence ever given in Canadian history for crimes like this. But unfortunately, with Canada's laws, this meant that he didn't have to serve that much time for what he had done to his own children, to all of these kids for so many years, to all the random people he had uh, victimized during the break-ins. And in 2012, he was allowed to walk free from prison after only serving 21 years. He was paroled out. And that's what led the Toronto Police Department, like I said at the beginning, to release a public safety warning, warning people that this guy was out of prison, he was walking amongst them, and that they didn't know what he was going to do next. So at the end of the day, if his sentences would have been imposed consecutively instead of concurrently, he would have been in prison for 180 years, meaning he would have died in prison. But since they don't do that in Canada, he only ended up serving those 21 years. Now, there is a little silver lining. Shortly after his release, he was re-arrested for breaking the terms of his parole. And at the time, he was on chemical castration drugs. He was actually urging his doctor to give him less of them. But since he was a first-time offender, as they called him back in 93 when he was sentenced, he was released shortly after violating the terms of his parole. And once again, he is somewhere out in Canadian society doing God knows what. I just thought I should make this TikTok to let you guys know that he is out there. And... He's dangerous. He is a terrible human being. I'm, I'm urging you, if you want to read more about this case, to look up the news article. It is one of the most disgusting things I've ever read. And yeah, this guy is really worst of the worst. I, I can't think of a worse individual than this guy.